Hi, everyone. So today I'm joined by Kathleen McKinnon. Hi, Kathleen. Hello. <laughs> Hi. So Kathleen McKinnon is the founder of an organization here in Canada called Nine Rising. And Nine Rising can be described as um, an organization that provides ethical and equitable education to actuate a world where all humans can thrive at being themselves. I love that. So basically, to go a little bit further, Kathleen, um, this is kind of a consulting company, or they do consulting for uh, government as well as um, other companies and organizations um, to provide education around basically, yeah, ethical and equitable practices, frameworks, marketing, you name it. Um, I'm doing a lot of policy and procedure development right now. That's not the fun stuff, but needs to be done. Um, so yeah, that's what we do. Awesome. And Kathleen is also a community support worker for, for transitional housing. Um, and those who are systemically vulnerable, either experiencing homelessness or addiction or any of those kinds of things, um, as well as a community care advocate. So multiple hats. Yeah. <laughs> and wow. so, yeah, so we're so excited to have you because today we really want to talk more about the concept of ableism. And so I've mentioned this in a few of my videos before, and I immediately thought of you because you were such a wonderful advocate in terms of a multitude of social justice issues, but you frequently discuss the topic of ableism. And so I would love to hear more from you today about just kind of what this topic is, what ableism is, and kind of a general overview of how it permeates society as it's structured currently, and then also, you know, what it kind of means for people who are living with mental illness. Okay, amazing. We'll get into this. So when when I think of ableism, I I really do think of how how society is built. Now for us in Canada, we're obviously a colonized country. Um, and due to colonization, we also live in um, a white supremacist country because we've been colonized. And so when I think about how our systems were brought up and who was in charge of creating these systems, they were built with one ideal person in mind. And oftentimes that's going to be a, and I, and I know you probably go through some of these words, so just please jump in at any time, but the, typically it's built for a cisgender white male who is non-disabled and, um, and also a cisgender white female that's non-disabled. Um, there's a lot of privilege in the work that I do because I am able to move through a lot of spaces that a lot of folks that are moving, that the house or the building wasn't built for, or the system, um, they don't have that entry point. And I think that it's so important to be aware when we talk about ableism. So for me, what ableism looks like in my life is I'm able to, work, socialize, thrive, access the help that I need because the system, whether it be our government, um, the law, whether it be, well, I guess government and the law are like hand in hand, whether it be for-profit companies, nonprofits, they recognize my identity and they affirm my existence as valid and worthy of care. And the type of care that I need is far more accessible to me. In terms of care work and the work that I do, um, I find so many folks don't perhaps recognize the ableism within the work that they do or perpetuate. An example of ableism in, in the work that I do for transitional housing might look like um, giving care to someone only if they present in a way that I see as valid. So if I'm looking for someone to mirror back to me an identity that I'm comfortable affirming, then they're valid and worthy of care. And I think in so many places and spaces, whether it be as we chatted about earlier, the education system or the medical system or mental health. Um, when we, when we see folks and we're helping folks, I find that sometimes people do not get the care that they deserve based on people's definition of who's deserving of care. And to me, that's ableism. Yeah, for sure. And we definitely see that within, you know, mental health care. Um, we have, a, an image in our mind or, you know, Healthcare providers often have an image in our mind about who is deserving of mental health care and what an ideal client looks like and fits the stereotype. And that's a very small window, right? So when we talk about who's deserving of that care, I find that again, whoever's developing the programming or the systems, they're not developing it with the folks that need access to support or that require these services. Like we're not centering folks that require the support, right? Um, and I think that's a really, really big deal is that I hope and I'm seeing people evolving into making sure that we're centering and shifting the power dynamic into the hands of those that should be creating these processes, but you're still not seeing it enough. 
Yeah. And I think you've touched on a lot of the intersectionality of the topic of, of ableism. You know, it, it's not just this, this concept of, you know, fitting an ideal framework is not just to do with ableism and disabilities and whatnot. You mentioned cisgender, male, white, all of these different, you know, identities or whatnot factors of identity contribute to this kind of othering Mm -hmm. uh, of the system. And so, but focusing more on ableism, what are we talking about some of the kind of social societal structures that are currently in place where ableism is, you know, rampant. (laughs) So education, the workforce, can you talk a bit about some of those? Yes. So um, I find that let's talk about the workforce, for example, is folks that I work with that perhaps want to access um, the workforce. They're very deserving to have employment and whatever that looks like for them. And we know that a nine to five model is a very outdated system to begin with that serves nobody. Um, And when I say nobody, whatever your exception may be, but truthfully, I don't think it does. And so the ableism that can perpetuate, for example, is let's think of if someone's moving through mental health or um, even if someone, so mental health, or if someone's not neurotypical. So if someone is autistic or has other neurodivergence, um, you see so many times in work where people aren't um, performing in a certain way or sounding a certain way, that they're deemed as less qualified, less worthy, or what have you, of participating in the workforce. Like, for example, um, I even remember a friend of mine who had a traumatic brain injury and wasn't able to perform at work because obviously they're moving through a lot and that's impacting them cognitively, that's impacting their mood, their mental health. Um, And I know within that employment, they were segued out of that employment opportunity just based on them not being able to perform. And so I think that, again, a lot of when we talk about disability justice or ableism and the way in which we treat folks in employment or otherwise, it's so rooted in capitalism. Like if you cannot keep, keep up, then like you're just in you're a cog in the wheel that's like not working for us so we're just going to pull you out I guess for populations that I work with like entering the workforce just like doesn't happen like there's no if I'm being really honest like we can talk about how it's um how the social model of disability is how society is organized really doesn't fit for anyone whether they're neurodiverse or neurotypical and to think about someone who is moving through transitional housing have to having to navigate how they're going to get permanent housing who has who's moving through mental health who perhaps is neurodivergent um and who's also moving through trauma like everyone also moves through trauma um having to navigate that while and there's this idea of people needing to fully participate in society and i think that we put a definition of that where you have like a full time job and you're able to sustain all of these things that qualify you um and affirm your identity and participation in society i don't think it's set up for people to succeed by any means so when we talk about ableism in the workforce i think it's rampant everywhere but i think the barrier to entry for folks and the expectation of performance and immediacy that we require things through capitalism um is incredibly overwhelming and disheartening yeah agreed so i mean i myself living with schizoaffective disorder have been pushed out of jobs because i didn't fit the modicum of you know capitalist structure that was yeah existent in the, in the workforce. And I, you know, talking with a lot of community members within the schizophrenia community, it's not an uncommon experience, you know, like, and frequently it'll happen very early on. So yeah, that barrier to entry totally exists because either someone won't even be, um, won't even be considered for a position because of their mental health diagnosis, if it's known, or if it's not known, if something will come up, that will make them question their ability, even though it really has nothing to do with their ability. It's just their symptoms coming about or, you know, a bit of neurodivergence coming through that just requires some accommodations or whatnot, but those accommodations aren't given rarely at all. And when we talk about accommodations too, and I, I really truly Lauren, please like call me into some learning. If, if you can in this, I do have a perspective that folks with neurodivergence or otherwise, like when we look at kind of, if we were to take away all the barriers for folks that um, have disabilities or diverse mental health needs, if we were to take away those barriers and accommodate everyone's needs, it's actually going to still benefit folks who are 
um, non-disabled or neurotypical, like that benefits folks like that too. Um, it really benefits everybody. And when we talk about accommodation, something that something that gets me and that I've seen before is that folks with neurodivergence have beautiful ways of looking at things differently or finding different solutions. And so to think that someone that's neurotypical has all, or um, non-disabled has all the answers. I just think that that's a very outdated approach. Like I get to work with so many brilliant people who are far more brilliant than I am. And um, to be called in to um, different ideas or way to look at things like it, I don't know if I think if you had everyone who's the same and we know this all the time, and this sounds so just repetitive is that if you were to have the same people in the room, you're going to get the same solutions and none of them are working. Um, and I'm not putting that on folks to fix things or change things who have disabilities. I just think that it's such an asset to have so many different people in the room. Um, which is why I find it frustrating myself. And I'm sure you do that folks don't accommodate and look at the barriers for people to participate, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just kind of providing more flexibility in terms of how we allow people to contribute because, you know, the current model of how contributions are made to society, to the workforce, to whatever are not, are not a great fit for everyone. And so having more flexibility in that, and that's really what we mean by accommodations. You know, like I think when people hear accommodations, they're like, oh yeah, you're giving them a free pass or, you know, you're making leniencies for people who are neurodivergent or who have a disability or whatever, but that's not what it means. It's just flexibility in terms of the way the work is structured. 100%. I I even have folks, and this is, this is kind of like people who cancel meetings, I'm sure you've met people that like loathe it, that are like, this is so disrespectful or what have you. And this is a really small example, but we don't know what anyone goes through. I don't know if your cat's died. I don't know if you're moving through a hard mental health day, but for me to, I think, put that um, power, power complex in play where I get to decide that either you've deemed my, my time, like unworthy of your presence and therefore you're not showing up. Like, I think that again, so many people center themselves in, in like we center ourselves all the time. But I think if we had more of a community approach, like you're not late for a meeting because you're disrespecting my time. You're not, not showing up because you disrespect my time. I have no idea what your circumstances look like. And even if we're looking at COVID right now, everyone is moving through something. And again, we are very much in different boats. We're in the same sea of it, but we have different uh, resources for support. And it's kind of even what I'm finding right now. Like some clients, some clients are doing great. Some clients have had um, a freeze on their rents or otherwise, while as other folks are really moving through it, where there's a lot of support nets that were supposed to be there that are falling out for them. And yet society is like, well, why aren't you still performing like at a hundred out of 10? And that's absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just having more compassion for everyone, not even just people who have a disability or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was kind of the workforce. Is there anything in addition in terms of like moving through education systems and whatnot that you would want to talk about, about ableism? I think education systems, probably my biggest bone to pick is in regards. Well, I think if anyone has a post-secondary education experience that is profound and wonderful, wonder awesome i'm not i don't want to negate that um that it can be a wonderful experience to explore post secondary i really want to talk about the privilege in that and how post secondary i think is a very oppressive system and institution um whether again it's post secondary whether it's high school um junior high middle school elementary school but ultimately the way in which we value education is is really oppressive and an ableist. I think that there's so many ways of which we've designed it to only work for certain folks. Um, I don't think people learn the way we've already assumed. I'm not specifically an expert in education, but really what gets me is when we have folks entering the workplace who have all this beautiful lived expertise and experience, and yet we're looking for a degree or a master's or a PhD. And that access is such a privilege. And ultimately to be able to survive in a system where you have to take five courses and then all these labs and power through it is unsustainable, I think, for so many people. Um, and then you have, and again, I'm not a professor, but I find it very bizarre how in these systems, you also have like two people that are deeming your work as valid or not valid. Whereas, and Lauren, I know you know this too, like you've worked in the field, you've been educated in the field. And my question is like, 
there's a beautiful balance often of learning, learning from doing and participating and in lived expertise, and then also learning from from the schools, but then your books are also made by all these old white dudes. And that might sound harsh, but at the same time, I do not think male pale and stale is like the cream of the crop for education. (laughs) You know? Yeah, I agree. (laughs) So ableism in education, I mean, I think there's so many ways. I even think about how in the pandemic, we're finally shifting to online education while as like folks with disabilities have been asking for so long to have better access to education based on their needs. And all of a sudden, when all of these non-disabled folks need access because it threatens their health and safety, we're going to shift things over to online when to get accommodations all the time for people, it it's very rarely met and until until someone who is non-disabled experiences it or cares about it, oftentimes people will not make accommodations and shift. So, and I don't know, like my question for you, Lauren, is where do you see ableism showing up in the education system? Because I've talked about the gamut of it, but is there anything that you relate to or that kind of comes up for you? I mean, yeah. So I, we recently did a video on my experience with post-secondary education, experience with university. And yeah, basically everything you've mentioned in terms of, you know, barriers when it comes to accommodations, like you mentioned, all of a sudden now when everyone who is non-disabled needs accommodations, oh, sure. You know, we've always had that ability to provide these accommodations. It's just who we deem deserving. And so coming up against that within the education system is hard. And, you know, coming up against whether it's more like the internalized feeling that I don't belong here because the, the structure of education doesn't fit the way I can thrive, or whether it's actual people like thinking that as well, like, oh, you don't belong here. And it's probably a combination of the two. And, you know, that combined with what you're learning, it's very ableist content. And, you know, so it's just a perfect storm of ableism, in my opinion, and something that really needs to be revised. 100%. And when you talk about like even the material being very ableist, I think about the power dynamics and I'm not sure if you found this, but even calling your educators into, Hey, this doesn't really check out. This isn't either my experience or this, this isn't okay to be saying it's really unfortunate, but I find this, whether it be in business or education, that you have so many people in power that have a get, their bottom line. And perhaps this is just in my brain because it was bothering me the other day, but I think so many people's bottom line is being right because it influences money and power. And so even if you have these people at the helm that can make a place more inclusive, less ableist, um, full of a beautiful, um, landscape of education that they do ultimately have access to, to begin with, people are so, um, I programmed would be probably my choice of language, like chosenly programmed to not want to be wrong because it could affect their own bottom line. That it's unfortunate that I think when you really ask folks to kind of evaluate, like, where are you at? Where could we shift things? Or what you're presenting me just seems inaccurate at this point, that they're not willing to go beyond the concept of what they have previously known, been taught, or see the world as. I just find that in education or in business as well, And what's really frustrating is that to get someone to try on a new lens that actually benefits everybody can be really difficult and frustrating. And that's from myself as a non-disabled person. So when I watch it from my clients or otherwise, I just, I don't feel like we properly acknowledge the exhaustion socially, physically, and psychologically that folks with disabilities experience trying to navigate a system that was not built for them. Yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of the power dynamic involved in this. In order to provide accommodations and increase diversity and whatnot within these systems, there's a degree of giving up power that needs to happen and a shift in power. And people just aren't really willing to go there, which is a huge barrier. And so that's something that definitely needs to be focused on. And I just kind of want to shift things too a little bit because, you know, people who are living with mental illness obviously go through the care system quite frequently too. And so I kind of want to dissect ableism within the care system. Yeah. Ableism in the care system. So um, whether it's um, mental health or addictions or mental health or schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, really anything. um, I, 
I just kind of think that we've set up A plus B equals C. And that's from my standpoint as someone that supports folks is, okay, this is the step, this is the step, this is the step. And that's not how folks operate ever. I don't know if you found that within your personal journey, if I can ask, like that there's this expectation that you're going to hit this, this, and this, is it, would that be part of your experience? Absolutely. I think that like, you know, the process of being diagnosed with a mental illness is very formulaic, which is kind of silly because, you know, everyone's experience is unique and is different. And so it's going to, you know, everyone's experience is going to be different. And so why would you try to fit them into this, these boxes in order to provide care and treatment? That just doesn't seem like a good approach. (laughs) A hundred percent. And did you watch, um, I've been really interested in Demi Lovato's docu-series. Did you watch it? I haven't it? seen it yet. No. Okay. You and Rob need to watch this cause it's amazing. But what made me very happy and then also very sad was watching, and this isn't, I, I really loved everything about Demi Lovato's documentary. So this isn't personal to her case. It's more so watching that she had the financial resources to have this team of like wonderfully thoughtful mental health professionals and addiction experts where they talked so much about how this journey is very much putting the autonomy in a person's hands and allowing them to guide through what um, their wellness journey or recovery journey looks like for them. And I use that languaging specifically of wellness journey. And you and I have talked about this where A wellness journey means that I'm not defining whether somebody wants to be sober, whether someone wants to recover, whether they want to be on their medication or not. Um, For someone to thrive for themselves, to impose a, a definition of what thriving looks like, that's very neurotypical. Like whether it's with, so for care, for example, we expect people to be grateful, be kind, be generous and like be almost submissive and like really well behaved in order to qualify for support. And we define success of support. If they're able to function within a system that we like that non-disabled people, quite frankly, I don't think like thriving in any ways. So we expect folks like mental wellness, I think looks so different for every person. What works for Lauren is not going to work for Kathleen and what works for Kathleen might not work for Lauren. Um, and so I think what was really beautiful and profound, even about Demi's experience was seeing someone being like, what works today might not work tomorrow. Let's talk about what you're thinking. Let's move through this together. And I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. So this is not me giving unsolicited advice. This is simply from the perspective of when we talk about care and meeting people with where they're at? Are we actually meeting with them with where they're at and every single time, or have we subscribed this journey that's unattainable and sets people up for, I don't want to say failure on their behalf, but more failure on the system's behalf where then they become bad or it's negative and we're attaching a label to that experience. Absolutely. And I think also, you know, you're, you're hitting on the topic of, you know, privilege within this. Demi has a lot of privilege in her journey through her mental illness and privilege comes up in a lot of forms, you know, and the one that I'm thinking about primarily with like ableism and whatnot is this concept of high functioning, which I hate, I hate that term. We tend to use like, we tend to use like, (laughs) yeah. So we tend to use like, and even well presenting doesn't quite hit the nail on the head, but that's kind of the terms that terminology that we use because high functioning implies that there are low functioning people. And that's just not the case. They're just functioning differently, you know, or p- presenting differently. It's not so much their functionality that's in question. It's how they're presenting to the world. And I think a lot of times the healthcare system takes in how someone is presenting and attributes attributes deservingness or attributes you know like basically determines their quality of care that they're going to receive based on what the client or the patient is presenting with and you kind of talked about that in terms of presenting you know kindly um gratefully and all those kinds of things that we expect of people working through the mental health care system um to be in order to be worthy of care. 100%. And 
I mean, I'll, I, I try sometimes in more like professional circumstances to hold off on swearing, but if you came in to a room and, and I was someone walking alongside you and your journey at this point in time, and you said, I said, how are you? And you're like, Kathleen F you like straight up, go F yourself. I don't want to talk to you. Great. And like, let's work on this together. What do you need in this moment in time? I'm not going to attach a positive or negative based off of what probably is a trauma response or what you're moving through in that period of time. I am, um, when we talk about privilege, the reality for me and my power dynamic and what I don't think some folks in social work positions or medical positions, and I, I think it's changing, but still too slowly consider is that my face is a face of someone who harms people. Like I look like the white cisgender, I have pretty privilege. I am a well-articulated white young female. So when I, when I meet certain folks, I am the person that's harmed them. And I, I have to authentically earn their trust. So they know that I want to walk alongside this person for whatever they need with no agenda attached other than I have your back. And truthfully, it's okay if that I'm not that person. This is the other thing I think in the system with power and privilege and ableism is you have so many people who want to do good work where they want to be these virtuous savior complexes of being these wonderful people who are going to like save you. So Lauren, if you came in, I'm like, listen, I'm going to save you today. You'd be like, screw you. I don't, I don't need the saving. And ultimately, like, I'm not here to save people. I'm here to walk alongside someone. If, if I'm not that person for that journey, I need to be willing to step back and be like, great. Who can I connect you to? Like, it's not about me. It's always decentering myself. And sorry, this is a bit of a tangent. Um, I recall in one circumstance, well, it, there's always different circumstances, but I was working with a, um, a, a person, a more of a vulnerable person who has really been harmed by white folks. And, um, I am a settler. I am white. And they said, no, absolutely not. Like get the heck out of my face. And I said, great. I said, super valid. And this person was in distress. And I just said, listen, I like, I got your back. I came back in five minutes and I said, you tell me what you need and I'll do anything I can to make it happen. And we went from there, but what I did and what we need to do, like the ableism has so much also to do with such a power dynamic is I'm in service to this person. They're not having to prove anything to me, to behave a certain way to me. I'm putting all of the power in their hands to let me know what they need. And we go from there. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important and like wonderful that that's your approach, because I think that that's lacking in terms of a lot of healthcare systems, particularly yeah. mental healthcare systems, where we have this set notion of what we can do for our patients and what or what you know, psychiatrists or psychologists or therapists or social workers, whatever, can do for their patients and, you know, what recovery needs to look like. And the power needs to be shifted back to the patient, the client or whatnot to really guide, you know, what they want their recovery to look like, what they want their wellness journey is, which is what you use to look like, um, so yeah, that's a huge shift that needs to happen. And that huge power dynamic needs to be worked out a lot more. We look at this definition of recovery or wellness. And I just, I still think that so many people in the service provision, perhaps this is a point I've already made, so I apologize, but um, people have this idea of what, again, wellness looks like or what recovery looks like. And I don't think we celebrate enough difference and not in, um, I don't mean to blanket harm with celebration. What I mean is if we have this concept of what's good and what's well, and then we're consistently going to be met with seeing people as like failures to our system. And that's going to impact the care that we give. And nobody's a failure to the system. The system's a failure. So I just, for me, it makes me really sad when I meet so many folks that are like, oh, I feel so bad for them. Like they're so messed up. And you'll hear this. I'm sure you've heard this in your job where you hear the way that people talk about clients and no, no, people aren't messed up. The system's messed up. Our community members are moving through pain at the helm of the system and people that work within the system. This isn't someone who is messed up. This isn't someone that, oh, you wish recovery for and you like they're, or either they're doing so good because they're performing, performing neurotypical. Everyone is valid at every single point of their journey, whatever that looks like. 
I think that's just a wonderful point to kind of wrap up this conversation on is just the idea that, you know, right now, people who are moving through the healthcare system and moving through the mental healthcare system are being given this idea that are being fed this idea that they are failures within that system. When that mentality needs to be completely flipped on its head because it's harming, completely harming the patient, the client, and it's harming society in general, it needs to be flipped on its head to be more like, no, our structures are failing these people. What can we do to better fit the needs, meet the needs of these these community members? So thank you. Yeah. And I mean, one question before I go that I'm curious is like, I wonder, and I would like more institutions to ask themselves, if we removed our bottom line from the equation, what changes would we be making? You know? Yeah. That's kind of something that I was going to throw out to you, you know, like what are some advice or, you know, what are some tips you can provide people who are living with schizophrenia or living with a mental illness or a disability of any kind really to navigate these ableist systems? And maybe that's something that we can come up together with. (laughs) Question. Um, this is still like a very, I think I fluctuate on that in the sense that one, a lot of folks that I work with apologize often for being, um, like an inconvenience to the system or having to go through so many pathways to get support. And one of the things that I tell anybody is that there's no reason to apologize. If something doesn't work for you that was supposed to be made for you, that's an error on their end. And I think like getting really blunt with that, but what I want to acknowledge about that piece of advice is that that can still impact the care or the treatment we get and a power dynamic. So for me as an advocate, I'm able to take systems to task like that, but perhaps that's going to impact the safety. Like Lauren, if you're receiving care at the hospital and you're like, no, this doesn't work for me what other solution do you have? They're going to be like, we'll take it or leave it. And that impacts your care. Well, as I can say that. So with, from that standpoint of knowing that it's not the person who's receiving the care's fault and that they should be able to advocate that and ask for something else, I probably would put it to you and say, is there a way that you would take how I advocate that? But how would you say that where you feel safe and like, you're still going to get care? <laughs> That's something I'm trying to figure out, you know, because you're right. Like, I've been in hospital or in situations where I was in a position of lesser power and my competency was just immediately in question. And so if I start to question these power dynamics at play, and if I start to question the system and how it's serving me and the people around me, I'm going to be seen as confrontational. I'm going to be seen as combative. And I'm probably going to get slapped with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder or something, because that's fun to dole out to anyone who is yeah. a little uncomfortable to be around, you know, like it's awful. Yeah. And so I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the answer is in terms of how someone who is in that position of lesser power can, can navigate it. And, you know, even myself, I am, I am in an incredibly privileged position within the disabled community because I am, I have an education around mental health and healthcare and whatnot. I am a white female, young white female who is semi-articulate, you know, like I, I have power when it comes into these you interactions. You disabled Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, what, what might work for me might not work for someone who's less well presenting or, you know, like it's a tricky subject to tackle. So I'm not sure what my advice is. I guess, I guess the greatest work can be done when you're not in those vulnerable situations. So advocating for policy change, advocating for, you know, community development measures, Um, And and that's really good one is my advocacy is going to look different than someone else's. So first prioritizing safety, like as we're talking about, because that's very complex. So what I loved is for me, knowing that um, even if I'm putting like my job at risk, my safety, it's still never going to be the same as someone that's experiencing harm very close and personal firsthand. So I know that the way that I can do the best advocacy most times is through um, really having those big conversations and still policy and still procedures, but oftentimes it's going to be because I present so neurotypical and articulate, it's going to be taking those people in power to task. And perhaps like 
it's just as worthy. It's just as valuable. And it's just important. Perhaps again, it's going to be through advocating through policy change, through emailing, through posting on social media. One thing that I learned through this work is how big the online community is for folks with disabilities and how much of a wonderful community it cultivates. Because so often, depending on where we're navigating um, outside of the online spaces, it can be very exclusionary, obviously, and high barrier. And so even sharing whatever you need to online to pump out to channels to get that going. That's a really great idea. And then the other thing that I thought about too was, and this is still privileged as well. Um, so this, this one is where, like, I think about it this way, where if I'm meeting someone in systemic homelessness, they're just going to need the person that shows up that day. But the other thing of knowing too, and I'm sure you've seen this is we, we like, looking for who's going to be the person in our corner. So if this person at this organization is not going to meet our needs, great. Where can we go next? Do you have another recommendation or saying, Hey, this doesn't work for me. I'm wondering if I can get another recommendation from you, or do you have anywhere else uh, for this or calling even sometimes if something like I live in British Columbia, and if I don't like something here, I'm calling to Alberta, which can fluctuate wherever you are, but I might get an opinion from someone in a different province or a different country. And then I might come back and say, listen, this is what's working really well here. And they might say, well, we're not going to do that for you. And then saying, great, well, I'm going to take this elsewhere. So that's still really exhausting. You shouldn't have to do that, but that's another opportunity to advocate for your needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that that's something that a lot of people who are navigating the mental health care system don't realize they have the right to do. You have the right to advocate for your own care. You have the right to ask for the things that are going to meet your needs the best. And yeah, that's really like the biggest piece of advice that I can give. Um, Hopefully it can be done in a way that isn't compromising to the care that you ultimately receive. But until these systems are completely (laughs) shifted and whatnot, that's what we've got. (laughs) Yeah. hundred percent. And the last, hopefully, and you let me know what you got for another question, but something that I'd really like to see on a service provision side is more of us having really beautifully honest conversations. And I call them beautiful because I think anytime, (laughs) call them beautiful. Um, Anytime that we are really, I think calling people into better work is important. I always, I always see it as a tremendous honor to have somebody be able to call me into doing better for myself. Um, So really asking your colleagues and doing real in the moment feedback or after action reflections of, Hey, I noticed this. What was your thought process or calling someone back after you just got off the phone with a client where it was an equitable being like, Hey, you know what? I would really like to go over this with you because I wouldn't like to see it happen again. Um, and taking the time to do that. And I also think employers should be rewarding that more and seeking more of that to better their organizations. Absolutely. That's like a huge reason why I wanted to have you on, because I know you have this beautiful mindset of constantly engaging in learning and learning, being okay with making mistakes and being open to growing and to doing things better moving forward. So thank you so much. I really wanted to share that perspective with our audience and whatnot. So thank you so much for sharing that. Well, thank you for having me. I love everything that you're doing. And I don't mean that. that I love everything you're doing. I adore everything you're doing. Um, and I really appreciate learning from you always. Um, and so I hope I can contribute something to your community. I'm willing absolutely to, I'm, I'm never always right. If I was right, I definitely still wouldn't be. So, um, I just appreciate the opportunity to kind of share. And again, um, I'm still always picking up some books and chatting with folks and learning along the way. So thanks for having this conversation with me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on to our channel to have this important conversation with us. I I think, I think it was very helpful. And I think that our audience will have learned a lot about ableism and how to navigate it and all that stuff. So thank you so much, Kathleen, for being a part of this interview. Thank you. It was fun being here. (laughs) All right. Take care.